Welcome back to Ozark Garage. Today we're talking about tuning our 143cc big bore kit we put on the Trail 125, making it into a Trail 143. Just to recap, this is a 2022 Honda Trail 125 CT125 Hunter Cub, whatever you want to call it. Previously installed a Yumanashi 143cc big bore kit on the engine. If you haven't seen that video, I'll put a link in the upper right hand corner so you can check that out and be sure to hit that like and subscribe button to see more videos from us. So we finally got some warmer weather around, which means we were able to put some miles on the Trail 143 and do some tuning. If you saw the previous video, you know I put a wideband oxygen sensor on the exhaust so I could see what the computer is doing fuel wise with the big bore kit and the larger injector we installed. The injector I ordered with the big bore kit and installed initially was 170 cc which turned out to be too big. I was looking at the wrong chart. So Yumanashi has two charts. They've got a chart for four valve engines and they've got a chart for two valve engines. Uh, the Trail 125 is a two valve engine. The head can't flow as much air so it doesn't need as much fuel. So make sure you order the correct one. The 170cc injector when installed would throw air fuel ratios down into the nines, um, which was way, way too rich and killing power. And really we didn't really drive it much doing that just enough to say, okay, this is wrong, and then went back and looked at the charts. After doing some more digging, I ordered 140cc and 150cc injectors from Yumanashi, which kind of is in the range of what they recommend for two valve engines. So before we talk too much about the actual test results, let's talk about the test itself. Not too far from the shop here, there's a 8% grade hill. And I call it the dyno hill because it's great for testing and tuning engines because it allows you a thousand feet of straight uphill before it curves to fully load the engine through the RPM range. So I've used it on my Lotus 7 a number of times. I've used it on motorcycles, all sorts of stuff. So it's kind of handy to have nearby. So over the thousand feet you're traveling, you've got 82 feet of elevation change, according to Google Earth anyway, but there's a downhill slope in front of it. So we're gonna start at the bottom of the hill, rolling start 55 miles per hour, and then we're gonna measure our speed at a mailbox near the top before it curves, giving us plenty of time to brake before it curves, wide open throttle. Uh, so we've got 1,000 feet at an 8% grade, and we've got a 200 pound rider doing the test every time. So with the stock 125cc engine, we didn't really measure the AFR on this because it got ripped out, but the before speed was 36 miles per hour at our test mailbox. Uh, with the 170cc injector, uh, we were getting AFRs down into the nines, and we didn't do the speed test, we didn't really drive it that much. Um, next we did the 150cc injector, and so the 170, 150cc, 140, those are all Yumanashi injectors by the way, that's what the Y means here. Uh, the 150cc injector, uh, we got up into the tens, okay, and mind you we're looking for 12 and a half, 12 to 13, anywhere in that range we'd be happy with because that's where you get peak torque and that's what we're after. So 150 cc's we got into the tens um, and our speed going up the test hill was 41 to 42, I'm gonna call it. So that's a substantial improvement from the 36 that we got with the stock engine, but we're still running rich. So I figured there was some improvements to be made there. Next with the 140 cc injector, our AFRs got into the 11s, which is you know, a lot closer to what we're after. And our speed, we got 43 miles per hour uh, at the mailbox on our 8% grade. So these are full throttle, like I said, going up the hill, or uh, measured at the mailbox. Um, and once again, looking for you know, 12 to 13 to get peak torque out of the system. After doing the 140cc, I looked on Yumanashi's website again. And so they said 120 cc is great for a stunt bike, but is not good for extended highway use because it'll lean it out in extended highway use. Yikes, that's not great. So uh, didn't go with the 120, even though it looks like 120 should work better. So I searched around and I found a 130 cc injector from Faster Minis. I didn't measure the flow rates of any of these injectors, by the way. This is just as stated by the manufacturer. With the 130 cc injector, uh, we were getting pretty close to 12. So it was 11.8 ish um, to 12, depending on, you know, the, the air fuel ratio gauge never reads the same constantly, it's always moving. So we got pretty close to 12 with the 130 cc uh, Faster Minis injector. But our top speed on the hill test, guess what? 
is still 43. That was still the best we could get out of it. The other thing to note with these air fuel ratios is this was all with 91 octane, no ethanol. Ethanol free gasoline will run richer than 10% ethanol because the 10% ethanol, your engine requires more ethanol than gasoline to reach the same air fuel ratio. And you know, without getting too far into the weeds about how the wideband air fuel ratio gauge actually reads and calculates and all this, uh, just know that if you're running ethanol fuel versus no ethanol fuel with the same size injector, it's gonna run richer with pure gasoline and it's gonna run leaner with 10% ethanol. With the 12 to one we were getting with the 130 cc injector, I went ahead and tried some 10% uh, ethanol fuel. And with the 10% ethanol fuel in it, the air fuel ratio did bump up as I expected and we were getting, call it 12.3, which is in line with what I expected. 43 still seemed to be where it would maxed out at. So with the 130 cc injector in, uh, we took it for some extended rides. With the 10% ethanol, which was only 87 octane, I guess I should note that. With the 87 octane 10% ethanol, we actually experienced some detonation a couple times going uphill. Um, and the air fuel ratio, according to the gauge, was in the 11s and 12s. Going up a hill, warm day, uh, experienced you know, classic detonation or pinging results. Uh, backed off, limped at home, drained the fuel tank, put 91 back in it, and actually switched back to the 143, the 140 cc injector and haven't had any trouble since. And we put a couple hundred miles on it with the 140 cc and higher octane fuel. Don't know that there was necessarily this injector's fault as much as it was the 87 octane. I would definitely recommend that uh, if you are going to put one of these big bore kits on because it has a much higher compression piston, stick to 91 octane or better, no matter what, and uh, 93 if you can get it. So another reason I went back to the 140 cc injector versus the 130 or something smaller. Our speed really didn't change here. So yeah, it's richer. I mean, this is in the 11s. It's not 11 to one, but it's more like 11 and a half to one. Um, at 11 and a half to one, our speed was still the same. We didn't add an oil cooler or anything to this engine. So having a little extra fuel in an air-cooled engine with no oil cooler will cool the engine more. So it keeps the cylinder head cooler. We've increased the amount of heat in the engine by putting a big bore kit in. It's consuming more fuel and air, but we didn't really do anything to increase its cooling capacity, uh, which is one of the things I wanted. I wanted to keep this simple. I didn't want to put, you know, a big oil cooler on it with a bunch of lines. I didn't want to give more things to go wrong. So the 140 cc injector will put a little extra fuel in. Yes, it'll hurt the fuel economy, but it'll also cool the engine more preventing all sorts of heat related issues. So another thing is I did buy one of the EFI devices, which is a basically a, a oxygen sensor tuner. So it puts a variable resistance uh, in between your computer and the oxygen sensor to kind of trick the computer. So I bought one of these EFI devices and I have it installed it. And the reason why is because riding the bike with the injector, with the different injectors, if you have the throttle anywhere more than half open or even half open, the computer doesn't seem to be looking at the oxygen sensor for results to tune because the air fuel ratio changes proportionally with the size of injector, period, end of story. Uh, furthermore, the oxygen sensor on the Trail 125 is a, is a narrow band, it's a single wire, and a narrow band oxygen sensor can't really read any richer than 12 and a half and can't read any leaner then say 15 and a half. So uh, the computer only uses the limited feedback from the oxygen sensor at low throttle settings or at idle because as sitting there at idle, all of these injectors idled exactly the same at about 14 and a half to one. Uh, otherwise, once you get under load and you open the throttle, they work proportionally to the size of the injector which is when the computer is running in what's called uh, open loop mode, where it's just running from the fuel table itself. So I haven't installed this, and I don't know that I will. I know a lot of people have installed these. Um, if I'm missing something, you think I really need to install this, put in the comments why, I'm really curious to know. But like I said, based on what I've seen with the wideband oxygen sensor, uh, I haven't installed this and I don't plan to, and we've put a couple hundred miles on it, and the bike seems to run just fine 
um, and today it's in the 80s and we went and rode and like I said it seems like it's just fine with higher octane fuel and the 140 cc injector. So while the wideband oxygen sensor and air fuel ratio gauge is incredibly useful for tuning, I really didn't have any intention of leaving it here permanently. All of the wiring and even the 3D printed gauge pod were all zip tied in place for easy removal. Plus this gauge had to go back to its real home on the Lotus 7 replica, so it got removed. Even though the O2 sensor unscrewed from the exhaust, the bung I welded in was there permanently, as I planned for it to be. The only problem with the welded in bung is it no longer cleared the factory skid plate. So, went ahead and modified it. The factory Trail 125 skid plate has a dropped center section to clear the exhaust coming out of the cylinder head. So my plan was simply to widen the drop center section to one side. It sounds easy enough, but the drop center section and the rest of the skid plate, in fact, all have compound curves. So a flat piece of metal definitely wasn't going to cut it. First, I grabbed a piece of 20 gauge scrap from the scrap pile and then cut it to size. Next, I used my grizzly brake to put a bend in it to the approximate angle I needed. The large flat portion will form the bottom of the skid plate, and then the angled part will be the new side piece tapering up to the original skid plate. To put the curve in it to match the rest of the skid plate, I used a Harbor Freight shrinker. After multiple times of shrinking, then checking the fit, then shrinking again, it was ready for some trimming. And this is just to match the existing shape of the skid plate as well as improve the fit here on the sides. And here's the final fit up ready for some welding. After fully welding, it got some primer and some paint, and here's the finished product. Doesn't look too bad, but someday I'd still hope to build a complete custom aluminum skid plate for this. If you want to see that, be sure to hit that subscribe button. In a previous video, I outlined some issues with the heel toe shifter, and someone made this comment. It sounded like an interesting idea, and it was less permanent than chopping off the rear of the shifter, so we figured we'd give it a try. Overall, it really is a worthwhile mod, and it does get the heel shifter out of the way for standing up. So, thanks for the suggestion. So let's talk about whether or not all of this was worth it. So for $313, we got the big bore kit and a single injector. Um, you know, if you don't have to go through and make the same mistake I had with testing multiple injectors, because you know which one to get, should be $313, depending on exchange rates. And we got a 15% increase in displacement on the engine. And on our test here, we got a 16% increase on speed. Once again, this is based on the accuracy of our speedometer here, but we got 16% more speed um, or reduced speed loss, if you will, on our test course here. So in addition to the speed we've gotten here, the bike has noticeably more power, especially you know just leaving from a stoplight or pulling out into traffic. I think it's safer because of that. And then these results are even more drastic with my wife who's a 100 pound rider and she's the one who rides it mostly. So now on flat ground, instead of being stuck at you know, 55 miles an hour, uh, she can go 61, 62-ish sometimes on flat ground. Uh, on, on hills, it still drops, but on this test course, she's going 50 miles an hour instead of 43, uh, but that's just the difference in the amount of, of rider weight there. So overall, I would say yes, th this is absolutely worth it to us. Um, it may, may or may not be worth it to you, depending on if you have the uh, tools and skills to install. But as easy as this was to install, I think this is totally worth it based on the results we've gotten here. Now, whether or not it affects it in longevity, we'll find out. But as easy as this engine is to work on, I'm not really worried about it. I'm going to call the 143cc kit an easy install. It's far less involved than the bigger kits that need a larger oil pump, an extra bearing, oil coolers, that sort of thing. So 300 bucks, easy install, 16% more speed. Um, I think it's worth it. Uh, you'll have to decide for yourself if you've done one of the bigger kits and you think those are a better value, post them in the comments below. I'm really curious to see what you think. If nothing else, be sure to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.